before I begin the main part of my remarks, I'd like to do what I always do these days, and that is uh, just refer you all uh, to three transcendent realities that I think are, are worth mentioning and just sort of keeping in the back of our minds as we discuss anything important these days. The first one is global warming. <clears throat> I mean, the fact that it's so daunting should not erase it from the back of our minds, all right? Okay. The second one is that the world is running out of oil and gas and water. The war in Iraq can be legitimately regarded as the first resource war of the 21st century. Unless we get our act together, it will be only the first. And third, and this is what I describe as the biggest sea change that I've witnessed in the 45 years that I've been in Washington. And that is that we no longer have, in any real sense, a free media. And that is big, folks. That is really big. Now, we do have the internet. We do have the web. That's the good news. But I can't help thinking that we really haven't figured imaginative ways to exploit that technology to its fullest. I look forward to folks younger than I that can figure that out. Now, with respect to uh, uh, what we're going to be discussing here, let me uh, read. In the Bronx, we, we used to say, Daddy, read me out of the paper. Or, Daddy, read me out of the book. So I'm going to read you out of the book for a paragraph or two. And this is a special book. It's called Defying Hitler. Sebastian Hafner. Has anybody, anybody familiar with it? It's the diary of a young lawyer in Berlin in the early 30s who kept a day-to-day -day account of what was going on. He never intended to publish it, but his, his uh, children found it and published it as a book. It became a bestseller in Germany and elsewhere. It's not very much uh, appreciated around here. Uh, so he's in Germany in the 1930s. This is 1933. And he says, I, I really can't blame, no one can really blame the Germans uh, for being so traumatized by the Reichstagsbrand, the, the, bur the burning of the Reichstag, the German parliament. What one can blame them for, and what shows their terrible collective weakness of character, says Hafner, is that this settled the matter. With sheepish, <laughs> sheepish submissiveness, Okay, I'll say that again. With sheepish uh, submissiveness, the German people accepted that as a result of the fire, each one of them lost what little personal freedom had been guaranteed them by their constitution, as though uh, it followed as a necessary consequence. If the communists burned down the Reichstag, or we might say, if the terrorists burned down the Twin Towers, it was perfectly in order that the government would take extra extraordinary, or as the German word says, decisive measures. And we might add to include the supreme international crime defined by Nuremberg, war of aggression. Now that's important, folks, because Nuremberg grappled with this. And they defined uh, war of aggression as the supreme international crime uh, differing from other war crimes only, only in as much as it contains the accumulated evil of the whole. Okay? Now, what would that accumulated evil be? What would be an example? Anyone? Torture. Torture. All right. What else? Civilian slaughter. Civilian slaughter. Kidnapping. Yeah, somebody's illegal kidding. Weapons. Illegal weapons, yeah. Putting people in black holes and not telling their wives or their children or, or the Red Cross. Yeah. Accumulated evil of the whole people. We'll be talking a little bit about that. But I want to continue with Hafner here and just, uh, just read another paragraph or two, if I may. He described the sequence of events in Germany as wholly within the normal range of psychology. And it helps to explain the almost inexplicable. The only thing that is missing is what in animals is called breeding. 
This is a solid inner kernel that cannot be shaken by external pressures and forces. Something noble and steely, a reserve of pride, principle, and dignity to be drawn on in the hour of trial. And he says, Hafner does, it is missing in Germans. As a nation, they have no backbone. And this was shown in March 1933 at the moment of truth when other nations rise spontaneously to the occasion and the Germans collectively and limply collapsed and yielded to a nervous breakdown. Germany became a nightmare for the rest of the world. And finally, Today, we Germans are yoked to a daily timetable, cogs in a mechanism we don't control, running steadily on rails and helpless if we become derailed. Only the daily routine provides security and continuity. Every European of the 20th century feels this in his bones. It is the cause of his reluctance to do anything that might derail his life. In this way, unsure of myself, temporizing, I performed my routine daily duties. But at home, I gave way to fruitless and ridiculous outbursts at the dinner table. Sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> Excluded from events and passive like millions of others, I let events come at me. And they did. Now I'm thinking of the last eight years, folks. And I'm thinking of what Hafner says here about the Germans. The question remains why no individuals ever spontaneously oppose some particular injustice or iniquity that they experienced? Well, in this country over the last eight years, you can say some, but not all. Not veterans of peace. When Cindy Sheehan rose to the occasion to fight that iniquity, to, to brace the president with the question, Mr. President, you say my son's death was worth it? You say that my son's death was for a noble cause? Well, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go visit you at Crawford and ask you what that noble cause was because I don't believe it. And what did Veterans of Peace do? Yeah, yeah. That's why I'm so, so very proud to be part of, of this movement and honored to be able to speak to you today. Uh, on January 20th of this year, we got rid of the Nazis. <laughs> the only question now is whether we have the courage to hold them accountable. And that's the big question in Washington. And I'm of the belief that we certainly need to hold them accountable. I, you know, I, uh, I think when you have the Vice President of the United States bragging about authorizing waterboarding, and when you have the Attorney General of the United States, the new one, the real one, saying waterboarding is torture, well, you don't have to be a lawyer to say, well, now Eric Holder and the president himself haven't left themselves a lot of wiggle room here. You know, they took a solemn oath to see that the laws of the country are faithfully enforced. Waterboarding was authorized, and not only waterboarding, of course, illegal wiretapping. Uh, you know, the president bragged that when that's first revealed, the president, our former president, that he had authorized that 30 times, 30 times. And most people don't realize that that was precisely the kind of thing J. Edgar Hoover used to do and precisely the reason for the Foreign Intelligence Sur Surveillance Act, 1978. Nor do they remember that this was one of the three charges against President Nixon when, when the articles of impeachment, the three of them were voted out of the Judiciary Committee. So here's the former President of the United States admitting for the first time in history to an impeach a demonstrably impeachable crime. Now, I'm, I'm uh, getting a little ahead of myself here. Um, and so I'd like to, to just tell you a little bit about how an intelligence analyst 
reacted to what we saw, we veteran intelligence professionals for sanity. There wasn't a lot of sanity in Washington in early 2003 or during 2002. It was a no-brainer what was happening, you know. We told the president on the day of uh, Colin Powell's speech, we wrote him a memo just as we used to. You know, we were on so active duty, you might say. Memorandum for the president from, in this case, veteran intelligence professionals for sanity. Uh, subject, uh, Colin Powell's speech earlier today at the UN. <clears throat> And we told him that intelligence analysts were under incredible pressure to skew their views to what they thought the, the, uh, the administration wanted. And we finished up with this sentence. Mr. President, we respectfully suggest that you broaden the circle of your advisors beyond those clearly bent on a war for which we see no cogent reason and from which we believe the unintended consequences are likely to be catastrophic. Now, it was a no-brainer. Scott Ritter was, uh, was running around warning people, uh, and yet they went ahead. Now, how do you explain all this? Well, when this crowd came in, that is eight years ago, we were exposed to the need to have faith-based this and faith-based that. But we intelligence professionals never thought that it would be asked to do faith-based intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you what faith-based intelligence is worth. Okay? <laughs> and if it's all right with you, I'm going to draw on my Irish heritage to, to tell you a little story. <clears throat> so there's these two nuns going home. Uh, from the hospital where they worked to the convent on a winter evening about four o'clock. It's getting dark already, and don't they run out of petrol. <laughs> Half a mile from the petrol station, they opened up the bonnet and the hood, and they looked underneath there, and there was no gas can, but there was a bedpan from the hospital. <laughs> so they said, well, this is better than nothing, so they went down to the petrol station, and I don't know if you have those of you who worked in the hospital can tell us all how unwieldy a bedpan is when it, <coughs> okay. So they go back to the car and one, one, uh, one nun is unscrewing the gas cap there and the other nun is struggling with, Arrgh! screeches to a halt. A great big limousine. One of those fancy ones where you push a button and, and the window goes down by itself. <laughs> And who's looking from the front but the Reverend Ian Paisley? <laughs> no. He sizes up the situation with the nun struggling with the bedpan. He says, sisters, I don't agree with your religion, but I do admire your faith. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, just to finish up the teaching point here, okay? Faith-based intelligence is worth what Ian Paisley thought was in that bedpan. <laughs> now, jokes aside, most of you know that it was worse than that. Yeah. It was deliberate. We know that now because we have, and this has been given very little attention because of the, what I call the fawning corporate press, we have the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence pronouncing what happened. I think I'm going to read you just a little bit here from, from that because it's so relevant. By a vote of 10 to 5 with two Republicans, Chuck Hagel and Olympia Snow con concurring, uh, the Senate Select Committee, after five years, <laughs> five years of investigation, concluded that the public statements of the Bush administration on weapons of mass destruction were not supported by the intelligence. So those of you who watch the president say, oh, you know, I'm really disappointed. And the intelligence was so, you know, the intelligence was so, I'm really disappointed. Well. Tell all your friends, he knew full well that the intelligence was bogus. Among other things, suppressed by the mainstream press, 
is the fact that my colleagues, my former colleagues on the operational side of CIA had recruited the Iraqi foreign minister, Naji Sabri. How many of you knew that? Very few. Well, okay. All right. This is more than usual, okay? We got him working in place. We, you know, the technical term, we turned him, okay? Saddam Hussein thought he was working for Saddam Hussein. He was reporting to us. And what did he tell us? A whole bunch of things. They all checked out. He also told us there aren't any weapons of mass destruction. And the president was told that on September 18, 2002. And if that's not enough, the British helped us recruit the head of Iraqi intelligence. His name is Habush. The end of January 2003, he told us the same thing. So please, please, when your friends say, you know, isn't it too bad that the poor president was deceived by, by uh, and, and disappointed with the intelligence? Please tell him that. Rockefeller, the senator, who normally doesn't go out uh, during the daytime, he's afraid of his own shadow. <laughs> and he was head of the Overlook, I'm sorry, supposed to be the Oversight Committee, you know, in Congress. They've been renamed the Overlook Committee. <laughs> I mean, I kid you not, when, uh, when Vice President Cheney briefed Jay Rockefeller and others uh, about the illegal wiretapping, anybody remember what Jay Rockefeller bragged about doing? Well, he wasn't going to take this sitting down. He went back to his desk, and since it was so sensitive, he couldn't have any secretary uh, type it out. But he wrote a letter. He wrote a letter to Dick Cheney saying, I don't know about this, I have some concerns about this. Signed to Jay Rockefeller, kept a copy in his safe and sent that courageous letter to the vice president. He never got an answer, but it came up again when Dick Cheney was doing one of his exit interviews and he says, you know, I just got a call from Jay Rockefeller. Senator Rockefeller asked me if I could give him a copy of that letter he sent me because he misplaced his copy, you know. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> well, anyhow, uh, Rockefeller stepped out of character for once. And this is what he said about the Senate report on whether the, whether the administration distorted the intelligence. I quote. Actually, I'll start the quote in the beginning. Quote, in making the case for war, the administration repeatedly presented intelligence as fact, when in reality, it was unsubstantiated, contradicted, or even non-existent. <laughs> Hello? Non-existent intelligence? Yeah. What would that be? <laughs> oh, maybe forgery? Maybe forgery? Who did the forgery? You know what? The FBI was never allowed to investigate that. But I'll bet you, I'll bet you, that the trail leads right under, right under the vice president's door. I'm not saying that he and, and Lynn Cheney sat down one night and forged these, uh, these documents about yellow cake in the Niger, but I think they had something to do with it. Okay, now, uh, I would like to ask uh, someone to turn the lights down if they can a little bit, uh, and I'm gonna warn you because this little, um, this little clip that I'm gonna show is only two minutes. So if you had a lot of breakfast and you're gonna doze off, you're gonna miss the whole thing, okay? <laughs> and this is on the final. <clears throat> so please look at the bottom and make sure you remember what date these statements were made. If you really want to know the truth about the state of Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, before the invasion, listen to Colin Powell in February 2001. He states clearly that there was no threat from Saddam Hussein. He has not developed any significant capability with respect to weapons of mass destruction. He is unable to project conventional power against his neighbors. And this is Condoleezza Rice, Bush's national security advisor, in July of the same year, saying the same thing putting the lie to their own propaganda. Uh, we are able to keep arms from him. His military forces have not been rebuilt. And that, many believe, was the truth, a truth that was covered up and conveniently forgotten after September the 11th, when Bush and Blair decided to attack Iraq. 
They found no weapons of mass destruction, no links with Al-Qaeda, no nuclear weapons, no 45-minute threat. So was it all a charade? Uh, it was 95% charade. charade. <laughs> a charade indeed. The invasion had been planned long ago. In July last year, Condoleezza Rice told another Bush official, that decision has been made, don't waste your breath. This is not what Bush told the American people. It's this that Can makes the inquiry in London by Lord Hutton look well, like a dramatic... We could have the lights, that would be great. Wake up. <laughs> okay, what was the date of Colin Powell's talk? February 2001. All right, and Condoleezza Rice. Yeah, actually, the date was July 29th, so about... What, about six weeks before 9-11. Now, uh, so uh, the Iraqis had no weapons of mass destruction before 9-11 and weren't a threat even to their immediate neighbors. And we were being asked to believe then after 9-11 when Cheney and Rumsfeld talked about all these terrible weapons that uh, weapons of mass destruction uh, descended like manna from the heavens. <laughs> for a soft landing on the sands of Iraq where God made that terrible mistake of putting our oil. <laughs> Give me a break. You don't get weapons of mass destruction in six weeks or two months, usually, or two years or six years. So, you know, it was a no-brainer. That's what was going on. Now, have any of you seen that footage? Okay, okay. It's in a documentary by John Pilger, who was the, oh. the voice there, okay? And uh, I, I must confess that as, hard, as closely as I used to watch the high-level statements on this subject, I had missed those two. I, I, I didn't remember that Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice said those things. And so I, I immediately, he sent me a, a, an advanced copy. I said, John, how'd you, where'd you get those, those clips? And he said, Ray, uh, I'm a professional journalist, and, uh, and so I, uh, I ordered all the tapes of uh, Condoleezza and uh, Powell on this subject and took about 20 of them into this uh, booth. My friends feared for my sanity, <laughs> but I went in and I spent two days and I found them. And I said to myself, wow, wow, you know, did no American journalist even look. I mean, they don't have to go into the booth. All I have to do is LexisNexis or even Google, and they find them. Well, I suspect they did, and I expect their editors said, "Please, please, you know, we're going to have this war. Uh, you know, we got to play ball. Be a patriot." So that's how bad it is, folks. That's so bad it is. Now, the uh, let me ask. Uh, how much time we have, because I want to leave a goodly amount of time for questions. When do, we, when do I have to uh, get off? Get ready. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, just apply the hook. Any, any, yes? We have to be out of here at 11.30, so, and the VFP National Guard is going to be there at 11.30. Okay, so I should, I should wind up at about 15 minutes. Okay, well, I'll, 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 I'll open the questions uh, in about 15 minutes, so that's okay. Is that all right? Oh, I could stop now if you prefer. Okay, well, I don't have any more jokes. <laughs> okay, well, in order to wage this war, the president, uh, Rove, told him, you really should go to Congress like your daddy did, you know, before the Gulf War. Yeah, it's good to have Congress aboard. And Congress, of course, didn't have any real intelligence about weapons of mass destruction. So, what happened? Yes. The head of the Senate Select Committee uh, called up George Tenet in mid-September, mind you, 2002, and said, where's the estimate on weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? And he said, oh, you know, we've been real busy. Uh, we don't have an estimate like that. And uh, Graham said, well, you're asking us to vote for war on the basis of this, and you don't have it? Well, you better do one. He says, well, we're really busy, you know. 
So Bob Graham goes back to Dick Durbin and he says, Tennant says he's too busy. And Durbin flies off the hand and says, you tell him no estimate, no vote on the war, okay? And so George Tennant goes down to the White House and says, we can't avoid an estimate anymore. I guess we're going to have to have to do one. And the president, or president, probably Andy Cord, somebody like that, says, okay, well, let me, I'll be right back to you. And he comes back, he says, well, all right, do an estimate. And just two conditions. It's got to come out like Dick Cheney said it was uh, in his major speech, August 26th, there in Nashville. Those, no, in other words, uh, all kinds of uh, weapons of mass destruction, renewed work on nuclear weapons, and UN inspectors aren't worth a damn. The whole, the whole nine yards is what he, he said then. And number two, it's got to be done in two weeks. <laughs> now, usually these things take, you know, at least two months. Why two weeks? Anybody figure that one out? Time tables already set for the military. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there were the elections coming up in November, and you know all those Democrats that made that terrible, terrible choice of voting against the glorious war where almost nobody got killed, but 250,000 veterans got poisoned. All right, another thing that the the fawning corporate press avoids. Okay, well, those, those Democrats suffered at the polls the next, uh, next midterm election. So Karl Rove was hell-bent and determined that this estimate would be done a month before the election. And indeed, the malleable managers that had bubbled to the top in my old agency saluted and served up the very worst national intelligence estimate in the history of our country. Wrong in every count. Now, there have been other bad ones. When I first came on board under President Kennedy, we gave him an estimate in September of 2000, I'm sorry, 1962, which said the, the Russians would never ever try to put missiles in Cuba because they know exactly what we'd do. You know, they, they well, we were wrong. But my friends, that was an honest mistake. It was dumb, it was mirror imaging. You know, we try not to do that again, but it was an honest mistake, this estimate, which I call the, which I call the whore of Leb uh, the whore of Babylon, uh, was dishonest from the get-go. Now I used to chair these uh, national intelligence estimates, and so I can sort of picture being there. You know, uh, when representatives, very senior people from the 16 now, 16, would you believe it, intelligence agencies in Washington, and what happens? You know, you say, okay, the question is, uh, how soon could Iraq get a nuclear weapon? All right, DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, what, what do you say? Three years. Okay, NSA, two years. All right, uh, CIA, two and a half years. Uh, State Department? Uh, State Department? <laughs>
But the State Department, <laughs> I guess it'd be an embarrassment, but the State Department, to its credit, and that's the point I'm trying to make, took, a, took another footnote and said, look, they're going to have so many technical difficulties, it's not going to be, you know, if it's five years, it's going to be toward the end of the five years. So there's still a lot of honest people around, and there were a whole bunch of honest people that forced through the estimate on Iran last time, November of 07, which said they had stopped. You hear that? They had stopped work on the weapons-related part of their nuclear program. When? 03. In the fall of 03. And was there any evidence that they were restarting it? No. no. Okay. Is there any evidence now that they restarted it? No. Well, how do we know? What we're trying to do is get somebody to order up an update of that estimate. That's what we used to do. We used to call it a memorandum to holders. So you do a memorandum to holders of the earlier estimate. You don't have to go through the whole nine yards anymore. You pick up from where they left off and say, there's been a change or there's not been a change. You know what? There hasn't been a change. But they don't want to say that because Iran is very much uh, you know, being portrayed as a threat again. And I, I'm dearly afraid that with Netanyahu taking over in Israel, that he will try to mousetrap our young president, as Khrushchev tried to do with uh, President Kennedy. I've been there, I've seen that. Okay, um, now, you may detect a little anger. Uh, you know, where I grew up in the Bronx, uh, anger was sort of frowned upon, you know? I mean, it was sort of a volatile place there in the Bronx, and uh, you could be angry for a day or maybe two, if you're Irish, they'd give you a week, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you weren't supposed to be angry all the time. And I found myself just really bursting with anger uh, from the very beginning of 2003. Because, you know, as we all could see, the war was going to come. And um, luckily, I remember something I learned in college. And for those younger folks, that were, you know, it, it's good to, to know that every now and then something sticks, you know. Now, I went to Fordham University, a Jesuit college in, in New York, in the Bronx. I walked to school. Uh, and they were big on St. Thomas Aquinas, real big on him. Matter of fact, uh, we had to read so much of Thomas Aquinas that students at other Catholic colleges used to go around calling us peeping Thomists. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, the point is, I remembered something from Thomas Aquinas that really helped. Because Aquinas, he had some weird ideas about women and about other things that he didn't know anything about. But he did have some good ideas on virtue and, and philosophical principles that he explored and uh, articulated. And one was, uh, he, he complained bitterly uh, that the word for the virtue of anger, hear that guys? The virtue of anger, manas inominata, remains unnamed. There was no word in Latin for the virtue of anger. He got angry, <laughs> no pun intended. That upset him because he wanted to write about this virtue of anger. See, he bought the old Pythagorean idea where virtue's in the middle, right? Okay, so too much of anything's no good, too little's also no good. Uh, take courage, for example. Courage is just enough of what you need. Foolhardiness, no good. Uh, timidity, no good. Well, um, Thomas complained that there's no way to approach this to describe the virtue of anger, and yet it was a reality, and he had to go back to the fourth century church and quote John Chrysostom, who said, he or she who is not angry when there is just cause for anger sins. Oh. Put that on a banner, you guys. John Chrysostom, fourth century. Um, now, Thomas, always being up to improving on things, uh, added his little corollary, and he said, well, what he did was he railed against what he called unreasoned patience. It's the best translation we can do. Can you imagine? Okay, unreasoned patience. Well, I talked about the Germans, okay? All right. And he defined, he said, unreasoned patience sows the seeds of vice, nourishes negligence, and encourages not only bad people, but good people to do evil. That made me feel a lot better. <laughs> so if, if I look virtuous this morning, it's because I'm so damn angry still. <laughs> um, I think Cindy Sheehan is, for me, the epitome of the virtue of anger. 
And I'm just so proud of this movement, this organization, and the support it gave Cindy. You know, Cindy was not one to avoid being angry. And uh, <laughs> as mo most of you know, she would not hesitate uh, to call appropriate people lying bastards. <clears throat> uh, and uh, she makes fun of me because when we were going to do official testimony before the Conyers Committee, I had the poor, poor judgment to write her a little email and say, now, Cindy, <laughs> probably be best if we didn't do the lying bastards bit this time. <laughs> and she said, Ray, come on. <laughs> of course, she wasn't going to, and it was totally un unnecessary for me to do that. But one of the super things I've done. Um, how, how, can we, how can we abide? How can we abide 4,260 of our young men and women being killed? How can we abide, you know, how many Iraqi civilians are dead now who would be alive if it weren't for the war? Now, some of the good estimates say a million. And others say, no, 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 it's just 100,000. What's wrong with that statement, just 100,000? You know, I, you know, give me a break, you know? And how many internal refugees? Two million. Two million. How many external refugees? Again, two million. Out of a country of, what, 26 million before the war? Wow. How can we stand for that? Um, I have learned in my life to listen to my children, sort of belatedly. <laughs> but now I listen to my grandchildren real carefully. And uh, we have seven and a half grandchildren right now. And uh, one due next week. Um, but little Claire, who was four years old at the time, uh, and in Oakland, California, uh, daughter of my daughter Kathleen, um, my wife knew that I was going to be on McNeil, or not McNeil, but the Lara report. And so she called Kathleen and said, Dad's going to be on me. You might want to watch it. So she and Claire sat before the TV and watched me on Lara. And when it was all over, Claire went to my daughter Kathleen. And she said, Mommy, Mommy, that was Grandpa. Mm -hmm. And Kathleen said, yeah. She said, well, Mommy, that means the other people are real, too. <laughs> Now that's cute, right? But think about what that means, people. If you don't know somebody in the picture, the other people aren't real, too. We used to at least have pictures of Vietnam. It's so easy to diss people if you never see them. And it's easier still if they don't look like you if their skin is a little darker or a lot darker. And you can call them gooks, or you can call them towel heads, sand niggers, which is what our troops are trained to call these folks. You know, racism, I hate to say, plays a big, big role in all this. We heard uh, James Yee. What did they call him? Anybody remember? Chinese. The Chinese Taliban. Aaron Watata, General Taguba. You know, Taguba did the only honest report on Abu Ghraib. And what happens to him? He's summoned into the limousine, General Abizaid in Kuwait. And what does Abizaid say? We're investigating your report, General Taguba, and we're also investigating you. Taguba told Cy Hirsch that after 32 years as an Army officer, he realized he was no longer working for the U.S. Army. He was working for the Mafia. Taguba's words. Take Mukasey, our dearly deported Attorney General, or take Mike McConnell, our recently deported Director of National Intelligence. Both of them, both of them said, well, waterboarding, um, well, it uh, was nasty. It, it would be torture if it were applied to me. <laughs> 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 
Well, those other people, I suppose, you know, they didn't say, but not to those other people, but what? So this is really, really important, folks. I think we have to focus on that because it's very sinister and it underlies a lot of this stuff. Uh, the Germans, uh, by and large, didn't measure up. Uh, the Sindhi Sheans were not supported <coughs> by the German people. There was no Veterans for Peace there in Germany. There were a couple of people who, who tried their best, though. Uh, Beatrix, uh, the Scholl sisters, certainly. The White Rose, the Weisse Rose, yeah. And uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the uh, uh, Lutheran pastor. Uh, he was, of course, hanged. There was another fellow. Have any of you heard of uh, Albrecht Haushofer? Oh, good. I'm going to tell you about Albrecht Haushofer. He was a geologue, uh, a, a geologist at the University of Berlin, and he got his doctorate by keeping his mouth shut. But when the war started and he saw his uh, Jewish friends being rounded up and he saw the, the chaos there in Europe, uh, he had uh, uh, pangs of conscience, okay? And he started speaking out against it and started accumulating a little bit of a following. And so the SS wrapped them up, threw them in, an, in another Berlin jail. And you know, they're very meticulous, the Germans. Uh, they won't shoot you or hang you, which were the two execution methods preferred, uh, without your signing a confession. Okay, Haushofer wouldn't sign the confession. And they got so ticked off toward the end of the war when they see it was ending uh, that they shot him anyway. As they picked him up off the floor, out comes this little zettel, little piece of paper from his pocket. It was his confession. It was written in the form of a sonnet. It's very brief. I'd like to read it to you and translate, okay? Schuld. Anybody have German? Guilty. Guilty. Yeah, guilt, okay? Doch bin ich schuldig, aber anders als ihr denkt. Yeah, I'm, I'm guilty, but it's not what you're thinking. Ich musste früher, früher, earlier, ich musste früher meine Pflicht erkennen. I should have earlier recognized my duty. Ich musste schärfer Unheil, Unheil nennen. I should have schärfer, more sharply called evil, evil. Mein Urteil habe ich zu lang gelenkt. I put off my judgment far too long. Ich habe gewarnt, I did warn, and he, and he did, aber nicht genug, enough, und klar, 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 oh klar. I did warn, but not enough, und klar, und heute was, weiß ich, was ich schuldig war. And today I recognize what I was guilty of. Now, I want to wrap this up uh, and just say that uh, I'm delighted that to be with a group that has spoken out, that didn't keep silent, and uh, that didn't get discouraged uh, by uh, all those years where it seemed to be not successful. See, this concept, this American concept of success is really pernicious, you know? <laughs> uh, we shouldn't be doing things but we always do, uh, without, you know, all we try to do is piece together, will I be sex successful at this? And if there's a reasonable chance, will you do it? Well, the kind of activity that we're engaged in, uh, protesting lies, murder, and, the so, and so forth, uh, that has its own justification. Uh, we're not supposed to be successful, we're supposed to be faithful. We're supposed to do what's right. And I'm thinking of that, that gentleman Perhaps you've heard this real story. Uh, he, he goes out before uh, prisons when people are being executed, and he has this big sign against capital punishment. And at one point, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the newspaper people came up and says, you know, this is pretty feckless. Here it is, pouring rain. You're saying nobody's looking at you. you what, what, kind of, what kind of result do you, do you expect to get from holding this against capital punishment sign? He says, well, you know, he says, I'm, I'm not trying to, uh, expecting that the, uh, change the system. I just don't want the system to change me. Mm. Yeah. I think that's what this is about. Wendell Berry, one of my favorite authors, says that protest that endures is moved by a hope far more modest 
than that of public success, namely the hope of preserving qualities in one's own heart and spirit that would be destroyed by acquiescence. One of my favorite uh, parts of Victor Hugo's Les Miserables, remember the, the good bishop, Bishop Bienvenu, who, who tells the police that he gave the candlesticks to uh, Jean Valjean? Um, uh, Hugo uh, permits himself some editorial observations here and points out that this bishop is never going to go anywhere. You know, he's, he just con he's, he's concerned about his people. You know, he's not concerned about moving up to be archbishop. And as a result, he can't even get priests to work in his diocese because, you know, they will be hindered in their career advancement. Then he, Hugo says, well, you know, success is an ugly word. It's a very ugly word because all too often people confuse it with merit. <laughs> now, I love that. Nobody else seems to love it as much as I, but I think it speaks volumes. And I'd like to close here with a, uh, with a recognition that there's a lot of pain involved in all this stuff. And that somehow uh, we need to recognize that uh, even as we try to keep a, a, a positive and, if possible, a joyful outlook on, on what we're doing. This is Sir Rainer Marie Rilke. And, and talking about suffering and the heaviness. The poet says, give the heaviness back to the weight of the earth. The mountains are heavy, heavy the oceans. Even the trees you planted as children long since grew too heavy. You could not sustain them, ah, but the breezes. And with another word for breezes, the spirit, ruha, spiritus. Well, may the spirit that sustains people like Rachel Corey and Cindy Sheehan and lifts their heaviness, lift ours as well, and empower us all to keep working for justice and peace. Si se puede. Thank you. Uh, ten minutes questions? Yeah. Check her shirt there? Thank you. Well, we need to keep Obama's feet to the fire. That's for sure, okay? Now, uh, a lot of us were disappointed that there's going to be 35 to 50,000 people there until the end, which is the end of 2011. So that's the bad news. The good news is that there is going to be an end, 2011, if we do our part and hold his feet to the fire. He has said that. We have to keep him to that promise. As far as Afghanistan is concerned, that's a fool's errand. I think he recognizes that, and, and when he asked the, the general out there, McKiernan, what are you going to do with these troops? He was not satisfied with the answer he got, okay? So that shows a certain perspicaciousness on, on Obama's part, and he only gave them only 17,000 instead of the 30,000 they wanted. Now, it looks very much like they're going to try to pick out Taliban people that they can negotiate with, and not get further involved. But again, we need to keep his feet to the fire. And when your friends ask you, you know, what about Afghanistan? And we, we heard some eloquence on that yesterday. You know, my favorite thing is, well, you know, uh, this goes back a ways, but civilize, civilization should have learned a lesson back 2,500 years ago. And remember that fellow Alexander the Great? You know, you know why he was great? He turned around and went back. Yeah, he turned around. He couldn't. Try to get through Afghanistan and was besieged by all these militants that have this thing about people invading their country, you know. And so he turned around, changed his mind, went back. So uh, that's what we need to, you know, not only the Alexander the Great, you had the Persians, the Indians, the Mongolians, the British, and the Russians, for God's sake. We're going to do it? Tell your friends, please. Yeah, Ed. Well, all I can say is that it is necessary uh, to address this head on. And one way is to hold accountable uh, the people in the Bush administration who have admitted to torture, have admitted to uh, eavesdropping and so forth. There's a big debate going on in Washington now. Should we have a commission? 
to explore and fact find and you know, educate everybody as to what went on? Or should we have a special prosecutor with the task of taking what is already revealed and proceeding in a juridical way? My, to me, it's a no-brainer. You know, there's enough evidence out there what went on. I mean, uh, Dennis Kucinich, bless his heart, served up 35 articles of impeachment against this team. And they're all very valid and provable, okay? So to the degree you can lend your voices to that, you know, don't let Patrick Leahy say, as he has, oh, we have to have our focus on the future, and we just have to make sure that it doesn't happen again. That's our focus. Well, how the hell do you make sure it doesn't happen again if you let those off that uh, were the original purchase Please. Uh, last week, there was the release of those Justice Department memos justifying torture. How does that play out in the political arena? Well, uh, they're very damaging, of course. It's incredible that uh, people like John Yu would, would, uh, uh, would put, that, put his signature to that. But my, my view is a little different. Uh, you know, why is Yu on first, <laughs> so to speak? <laughs> Now, who's on first? You's on first. Well, bull. We have a memorandum, and I have it in my little backpack, signed by the President of the United States, dated February 7, 2002, titled Humane Treatment of Detainees. And what this memo does is say you don't have to pay any attention to Geneva or the War Crimes Act, 1996, passed by a Republican-dominated Congress, uh, we will treat detainees, quote, humanely, comma, as appropriate, comma, and as consistent with military necessity. Now, that's not what Geneva says. That's not what the war court, that is what the Senate has now identified as opening the door to torture. February 2002, long before they hired the mafia lawyers to come in and ex post facto uh, make sure it's, it's legal, you got the president, you got a smoking gun there. Now I can understand how upset and how angry, how virtuously angry, if you will, lawyers are. I mean, it's a prostitution of their profession. But I'm angry too. They corrupted my profession too. And I'm willing to, to, you know, to lay it out there at the, at the guy at the top because it wasn't the apples at the bottom of the barrel. It were the rotten apples at the very top of the barrel that poisoned the whole barrel. Yes, please. Well, um, I, would say, I would say this, that uh, one of my most profound disappointments has been that the institutional churches, uh, just as in Nazi Germany, uh, cannot, could not, do not find their voice. The Pope was here, Pope was here almost a year ago. <laughs> he arrived the week after ABC News said that the Vice President, Secretaries of State, Defense, the Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs, the Attorney General, the head of the CIA used to meet weekly in the Situation Room in the White House to plan which kind of torture techniques are most appropriate for which high-level detainees. George Tenet would bring in his guys and say, well, this is waterboarding, uh, what do you think? You think maybe Abu Zubaydah? That's what happened. And when ABC tried to let the president off the hook, and said, well, you weren't there, right? And the president says, no, yeah, but I knew about it. I ordered those meetings. <laughs> oh, okay. Now, my point is, the, the Pope arrives the next week, right? He arrives on the very day that the Catholic-dominated Supreme Court, and I'm not pinging on Catholic, I'm a Catholic, I'm proud to be one uh, with a small c, okay? But the Supreme Court is debating how many grams of this poison would be appropriate for killing that guy in Tennessee? Would it be, I'm listening to this on you know, C-SPAN. Uh, here's a prominent Catholic layman, Scalia. Uh, I don't think, uh, well, two grams may be, yeah, you think you need two and a half grams. And besides, where does it say in the Constitution uh, that executions have to be painless? That's what he said, <laughs> Scalia. And bottom line for me, the Pope made a deal with the authorities here. They wouldn't bring up the business about pedophilia. He'd take care of that, apologize profusely. If he didn't mention Iraq, if he didn't mention you know, capital punishment, which is you know, against our belief, you know, I'm really against capital punishment, but I, I must say I've been sorely tempted to make some exceptions. <laughs> <laughs>
So, so that's where I come at. The institutional church doesn't have a voice, or doesn't doesn't. And now there are ex certain exceptions, of course. Some of the WCC folks and the Unitarians, are, but you know, it's really up to us. That means that you know, just as in Germany, the Lutherans, Catholics, we're not going to speak out then. So it's up to us as a confessing church, as a people who really feel strongly about these things, to uh, to make loud noise and make sure that we use our our special cachet. And this is something that you know, I've learned. I meant to mention this in my talk. Um, the fact that I worked for the CIA for 27 years, well, that's sort of interesting to folks. Uh, but I can be dismissed as one of those liberal guys from Washington until they learned that I spent two years as a U.S. Army officer, Bragg, Benning, Hollibird, you know, the whole nine yards, and that I know a little bit about what really goes on in the military. You guys have that same cachet up the, you know, <laughs> up the gazoo, okay? And so, please, use it. People respect that as well they should. And, uh, you know, if it works for me, for my two years of service in the early 60s as an infantry and, and intelligence officer, MOS 9300, um, then it should work in spades for you. Do we have to stop? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.